Welcome to Bible Track Echoes. This program is the radio ministry of Bible Tracks Incorporated. Our mission is to take the Word of God to all the world. Our Bible teacher is the director of Bible Tracks, Pastor Mark Smith. Since 1938, Bible Tracks Incorporated has been publishing clear gospel tracks and supplying them to churches, missionaries, and individuals all over the world and all at no charge. Information on how you can receive a free sample pack of our tracts will be given at the end of this broadcast. Now for our Bible study, here is our teacher, Pastor Mark Smith. How do you do, my friend? Welcome to the broadcast. Thank you so much for letting us be a part of your day, and thank you for wanting to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, right now, my Bible is sitting open in front of me. It's open to the book of Ruth and chapter one. We're doing a study through the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter one, get your Bible out and join me there. Get something with which you can jot down some notes. I've got three words particularly at the end I hope that you will take note of and add to your note paper there. But with that pen and paper handy, you can also jot down our contact information because I want to put a free sample packet of our gospel tracks into your hand. I've got one of our gospel tracks right now in my hand. Now, a gospel tract is simply an evangelism tool. It's a short written presentation of God's plan of salvation laid out so very clearly. It begins with a story to draw in the reader and many, I mean multitudes of thousands of people every year come to Christ using this tool called a gospel track. This one's entitled, Seriously Speaking, You May Be Sincerely Wrong. If you've been around the horn very far, you know that there's a lot of people who think seriously about spiritual things, but in their sincerity, they have some wrong, non-biblical ideas about how to solve their spiritual problems. We'll say about that more about that here in just a moment. Just in case you have not been part of our study in the book of Ruth for uh, thus far, let me give you the fact of my title here. Uh, I've called this study, Faith Finds Rest in Ruin. I call this whole study, Faith Finds Rest in Ruin. And on Monday's study, we saw that that word rest comes up in verse 9 of chapter 1. We saw that in Naomi's desire to find rest for her two widowed daughters-in-law, we find in Naomi a picture of Jesus who wants to provide rest for us spiritually. But now we come to see how those two widowed ladies respond to the offer of rest. The two gals will each make a decision, and of course, decisions have consequences. Years ago, I was teaching this chapter to a group of teenagers, and you know teenagers, they are a unique breed of human being, as we all were at that stage of life. Well, I was trying to catch their attention and hopefully draw them into the study. So I labeled these two gals this way. One I called a kisser, you heard me, a kisser, and the other a cleaver. Well, any time you talk about kissing with teenagers, you probably do have their attention. So join me as we begin today and tomorrow to talk about this kisser and a cleaver. I mentioned a gospel tract here a moment ago, and again, the title of the one in my hand right now is, Seriously Speaking, You May Be Sincerely Wrong. It begins with the story of somebody taking some medicine. They are just sure, they're sincere of the fact that it is the right medicine for them, but lo and behold, on the bottle, there is this skull and crossbones, which is a symbol of poison. The person is sincere in taking it, but what they're taking will kill them. So many people are sincere about their religiosity. They're sincere about their morality. They think it's the right, well, let me use the word, the right medicine for their sin-sick soul, but it's not. The right medicine for getting the sickness of sin off our soul is Jesus Christ and the shed blood of Calvary. Here's a great, simple, clear tool in giving out the gospel. Seriously speaking, you may be sincerely wrong. This is just one of the 40 tracks in a sample packet of tracks I want to give to you. Have pen and paper ready so when my announcer gives our contact information, you can jot it down. And thus by give us your name and address, we'll send you that free sample packet 
normally in the next business day's mail. If your Bible's open to the book of Ruth, chapter 1, beginning at verse 11, here is what the Bible says. And Naomi said, talking to her two daughters-in-law, and Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old and have an husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they are grown? Would ye stay uh, for them for, from having husbands? Nay, much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. Now, we're going to stop the reading of the passage right there. There are three paragraphs in the chapter one of the book of Ruth. We are in paragraph number two, which begins at verse six and ends at verse 18. I've titled this whole paragraph with these words, women decide, women decide. Now, this set of verses begins with a reason, notice the R words, the reason to return. We get that in verses six and seven. There's where Naomi decides to return to Israel. Then in verses eight, nine, and 10, we see the reaction to advice, reaction to advice. In these verses, the two younger widows, Ruth and Orpah, start going with Naomi, going back to Israel. They were Moabite women, of course, and thus they would have experienced a whole lot of shunning by the Jewish people once they got back to Bethlehem. So Naomi tells them to go back to their parents' home. Verse 10 shows that the girls were saying, no, 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 Naomi, we're going to go with you. All right, we've seen the reason to return and the reaction to the advice. Now, beginning at verse 11, 11 through 13, we are going to listen to Naomi give a reminder, my third word beginning with R, reminder of her limitations. Now, let me use three words, all beginning with the letter H, like in the word hot. The three words are going to be this, house, hope, and hand. Once more, house, hope hope and hand. Naomi tells the girls in verse 11 that her house is empty. She has no more sons to offer them by which to raise up descendants to keep the name of their dead husband alive. She's got nobody to offer, no other son to offer them. It was called leveret marriage back then. So there's her house is empty. Next in verse 12, Naomi says her hope is empty. She's too old to have any more sons. Even if she were to get married that very day, she couldn't have sons for them. And finally, Naomi says that God's hand is against her. We've got the house, the hope, and the hand. What Naomi is saying is that to stay, if these two gals stay with her, would mean that they would experience the trouble and the discipline from God that she was going to have to continue to deal with. Now, right here, we need to stop and we need to learn a lesson. These two girls, again, their names are Ruth and Orpah, these two girls were caught in the vortex of God's discipline on Naomi and Naomi's dead husband, Elimelech. The two girls were not guilty of disobeying God at all, but Naomi was guilty. But whenever you and I as believers, whenever we sin, there's always, listen now, there's always unintended consequences. Now, please listen to me. Whenever you and I who are believers, when we sin, there are going to be, not might be, there is going to be unintended consequences. Some time ago, at the local church where Nancy, my wife, and I attend, there was a college group there, and one of the college young men was preaching a sermon. And friend, it was really good. It was a great sermon. I told my wife later on, I wished I had preached that sermon. The content was good. His delivery was great. This young man has got a future if he stays in a right heart attitude with God. Anyway, this young man made three points about what happens when believers sin. Now, friend, listen to me. I'm talking to believers now. Can believers sin? Yes. Do believers sin? Yes. 1 John 1, 9 is written to believers. 
If we will confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is a verse focused on believers. But let me come back to my young preacher here. He was talking about what happens when believers sin. He talked about the promise of sin. He talked about the privacy of sin. And he talked about the price of sin. And here's what this young man said in synopsis. And he is absolutely right. First of all, the promise of sin. Sin always makes you a promise, but it lies Sin will promise to make you happy. It'll promise to meet your needs. It'll promise just just give you, fill up your heart, and you'll have no more wants. But it's a lie. Sin promises stuff, but it's a lie. It never tells the truth. Next, the young man said that the price tag for committing sin is always far higher than it first appears. Satan lied about the price tag for sin when he talked to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Well, he still tells lies about sin today. But what's worse, frankly, is that you and I, who are believers, we tell ourselves lies about the price tag of sin. We think we can get away with it and it won't affect us much. How foolish are we? But finally, the young man in preaching talked about sin's privacy and that it never stays private. What is it that we're told in the book of Numbers chapter 32? Be sure your sins will find you out. That verse means that all sin, all sin will be known and judged. No sin will go unnoticed by God. And I have found personally that God loves his children so much that in his, God's desire to see them walk in a godly Christ-like fashion, God will first bring conviction to the heart of the sinning believer in private. He will bring private conviction. If the believer repents at that stage, wonderful, praise God. But if not, God begins to widen the scope of who knows about this sin. Why does God do that? Well, because God wants us to repent of our sin and get back into sweet fellowship with him. So in his love and grace, you heard me, in his love and grace, God lets us experience shame. But let me add one more step here. If we as believers still at that point refuse to repent, then God often allows our sin to begin to be practiced by one of our own children, our biological children. When this happens and we see the disaster and the damage it brings to their lives, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit brings us up short personally in our own soul and we see what our sin has done. We recognize that it was our sin that's being shown that's showing up here in our child. And we see the brokenness that it brings to that child. Oh believer friend, are you playing with sin? Are you thinking you bought into the lie? Stop. The promises and the price tag and the privacy will never be enough. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Tract Echoes. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of our tracks, you can contact us by calling 309-828-6888. Our mailing address is Bible Tracks, P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. Again, our phone number is 309-828-6888. And our mailing address is P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. You can also contact us through our website. Our web address is BibleTracksInc.org. Remember, the word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. That address is BibleTracksInc.org. May the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.